The Purdue Boilermakers get ready to take on the Florida Atlantic Owls on Saturday night for homecoming 2022 at ross Aid Stadium. Kickoff will be at 7.30. We're expecting a great night for football. Purdue coming off a heartbreaking 32-29 loss to the Orange of Syracuse last week, so they'll try to even their record this week at 2-2. Two two. Good evening, everybody. It is the Jeff Brom Show. We're live at Walk-Ons in the Purdue Memorial Union. Uh, our phone number, if you'd like to get questions in for Coach Brown tonight, 888-246-2678. You can also check us on Facebook. We're on the Purdue Athletic site there, and we're also on Purdue Football Twitter site tonight, so you can follow along. If you're doing either of those, let us know where you're watching from, and you can get your questions in there as well. Along with the head coach, later on tonight, we'll be talking with linebacker O.C. Brothers, and we're going to give some love tonight to the special teams as we'll be talking with long snapper Nick Zacchino. But when we come back, we'll have the head coach. It is the Jeff Brom Show, presented by the Rorman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. Downing next to O'Connell in the backfield. Tracy in motion, O'Connell with time. Touchdown, Purdue! Watch Downing 38 as he comes across and gets a good block right there on Mustafer that allows for a little extra time. Now it's on O'Connell to anticipate and get that ball out in front of him on that left side. As they're turned around in the back end, Zaki Wheatley takes a bit of a bad angle and there's Charlie Jones. O'Connell, Maccabee, big hole, touchdown Purdue! And Syracuse finally gives up a red zone score. O'Connell looking over the middle, beautiful throw, finds his man, touchdown! On the button to Ferfari, and Purdue is clicking. The former quarterback's got some hands off of Ferry, but this is one of the things, Joe, that we've talked about here, right? O'Connell looking to the back of the end zone, touchdown! He goes to the tight end, Payne Durham! is right over Michael Jones' head. He's dropping into his zone coverage in a dart by O'Connell. He stays flat so he can cut off the safety like that and make a play on the ball. O'Connell to throw again. Sets his feet, long ball. Jones wide open. Touchdown! 36 yards going deep. O'Connell with a long ball. Favorite target, easy pickings. Purdue, big time. Charlie Jones in the slot. O'Connell steps up, throws to the end zone, touchdown! Welcome back to the Jeff Brown Show. We're live at Walk-Ons in the Purdue Memorial Union where it's always game day with a taste of Louisiana. Joined by the head coach and Jeff, every loss is difficult, but uh, when you are so close to winning a game as you were on Saturday, the sting I'm sure is a little bit sharper. Uh, a few days later, now that you've had a chance to reflect, look at films, what are your takeaways from that game on Saturday? Well, we have a lot of takeaways, and uh, without question, yeah, those uh, losses hurt in general, but when you lose uh, like that, yeah, it, it stings and uh, it burns and it uh, makes you angry, and that's what it's supposed to do. And So that's how I've been. I'm sure our players have been the same way, uh, but all you can do is uh, you know, identify all the mistakes you made, uh, go through them in great detail, uh, unfortunately relive them uh, the next day uh, so that you just kind of iron it out and define it and figure out what we can do to, to never let it happen again, and then you move forward. But it's, it's, uh, it's nearly not as fun as uh, winning a football game. And, uh, you know, when you're sitting at one and two and in three games you've outgained your opponent and you've had to lead in the fourth quarter uh, and you're one and two, it, it's not a lot of fun. So you just got to you know, figure it out and continue to work through it. During your press conference on, on uh, Monday, you talked a lot about penalties. Certainly penalties have been an issue in the two losses, 22 penalties in those two games. Uh, you went back, you showed the film of all of the penalties to the team. Is there a common theme among all those penalties this year? Well, yes, there is. And, um, you know, last year we were one of the least penalized teams in the country. I think we had 4.4 .4 penalties a game for around 45 yards, which is tremendous. So we did a really good job. And unfortunately this year uh, in two of the three games we have not. Uh, 
one game we had nine penalties for like 95 yards, another one 13 for 135. And when you play good football teams, uh, we're not that good uh, enough to, to overcome that. You, you have to do all the small things right. So uh, the common theme is we've um, had some 15-yard and sportsmanlike calls um, that uh, have to stop. And uh, you know, every once in a while, I guess they may happen, but you can't have them. You just gotta, you gotta, you gotta stop them. Uh, it can't happen. You gotta figure out what were they and, and why can, how can you not do it again? And, and we've talked about it. And uh, we've had a lot of, you know, penalties in the secondary, uh, a lot of penalties on defense, which is normally not common. You know, whether it's pass interference or defensive holding. Uh, late hit here and there. So we've had to, you know, go back and even adjust of what we're teaching and why we want to be physical and, and do things the right way. Uh, we can't have it. So what we've done is we said, look, uh, it's going to come down to all these penalties we've had. We've got to do everything in our power to not have them again. Uh, and when it comes to playing football, we have to have way more solid discipline and we cannot run our mouth. Got to keep our mouth shut and just play football as hard as we can. Uh, you really can't celebrate anymore. You congratulate your teammate when they make a good play, but you can't get into any type of celebration. Uh, you got to just play football uh, the right way and, and keep our mouths shut. So that's what we're going to work on this week and uh, see if it helps us improve. We talked a lot last week about the noise going in because you knew it was going to be a noisy environment. How did you feel like your team handled that aspect of the road game? Well, I think for the most part, we handled it pretty well. Um, it, you know, for, for a a dome that wasn't fully packed, it, it could get loud. It was loud. And, uh, you know what? It was hard to hear over the headset. It was a couple of times, uh, you know, they couldn't hear me calling the play in. Uh, we've had to adjust to that. But really, we didn't have a whole lot of pre-snap penalties. And the, and the two that we did, not that it matters, uh, but shouldn't have been on us. <laughs> uh, so as you go back and look at it, uh, we, we did a really good job. Uh, but we still have to just eliminate uh, those penalties. Uh, but as far as pre-snap penalties and cadence, you know, it affects you a little bit because you have to go on a silent cadence. You have to, you can't check near as much because people just can't hear what's going on. Uh, so it was to their advantage and uh, we weren't able to overcome it. As always, there are some positives you can take out of any game. And for the second time this year, even though you lost to Penn State and lost to Syracuse, in both games, you had to come from behind in the second half and take the lead. And especially this last game, you're down two touchdowns with eight minutes to play and made a great comeback. Well, that's what's disappointing uh, because uh, your team fights back. And uh, what could have been two just tremendous comebacks where everybody feels great about themselves and you feel like everything's going uh, exactly the way you want, uh, it didn't. It didn't happen. And we found a way to lose it. So it's about closing games. It's about finishing. Um, and uh, all three segments can do better. You know, offense can figure out ways to, in the Penn State game, you know, score or, uh, you know, move the ball down the field and get points. Uh, you know, defense in both the Penn State game and, and Syracuse, we have not been good in situational football. So two-minute drills uh, at the end of the half and end of the game in multiple games, we have not performed well. So we've had to go back and reevaluate and look at every snap of that excuse me, and put together a, what we think is a better plan moving forward. You know, the issue is, you know, we, we had a two-minute drill against Penn State uh, where we thought we gave up too much cushion. We gave up easy completions, and they went down the field, and they scored. Uh, and then we were a little more aggressive in the Syracuse game, and guess what? They went down the field, and they scored. Now, they, we had some penalties uh, that, that uh, without question hurt us. So you just got to find the right balance, uh, but we've got to do a better job. And I think we've worked hard to put a better plan together, uh, and hopefully it can work. The 2022 Purdue football season is presented by Purdue Global. Purdue Global is Purdue's accredited and affordable online solution for working adults. Persistence pays off at Purdue Global. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. It's the Jeff Brom Show presented by the Rorman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. Penn State may have to open it up now, but they don't. They give it to Singleton, and he's chopped down. Great job by Corey Trice. On second and eight, four receivers in the pattern. Strews is under heat. He's buried. Dropped quickly by Jack Sullivan. First and 22. On the ground with Dinka. Met by a host of Purdue tacklers. Kelly, 24 to 21. Clifford in trouble and sacked. They brought pressure. And this time it's humping. They'll toss it for Dinka. Dinka Angle has no running room whatsoever. Outstanding defensive work here in Douglas, the linebacker, the first man to intercept it. This is third and goal. Dinka is in the backfield with Cruz. Gavin pumps it. Protection breaking down. 
Throws one into traffic, deflected and picked off. Intercepted. Jamari Brown with the interception. Trying to get him acclimated to the atmosphere here. Gavin Cruz glides up in the pocket, gets tripped up and down. 12 yards, first down at the 48. Clifford over the middle. High and picked. Jefferson with room. Can he get a block? Chris Jefferson still on the move with a late. Jefferson, touchdown, Purdue. And as you watch Sean Clifford, he's going to be trying to get this route right here, and he's got the route. He's going to have Tinsley wide open and just airmails him. I mean, this, this ball is just way over his head. Tinsley can't even jump up there and try to bat it down or do anything. He can't try to disrupt Jefferson. Screws. Looks for that pass. It kicked off. Intercepted and this time. Cam Allen will work his way all the way. Touchdown. Welcome back. The Roman Automotive Group is supporting your Boilermakers as a presenting sponsor of the Jeff Brown Show and proud partner of Purdue Athletics, Roman Automotive Group, Boiler Up and Hammer Down. Uh, we were just talking, actually, in the break about uh, some games on Monday night. Did you have a favorite pro team growing up? You know what? My older brother liked the Cowboys, so I went ahead and liked the Steelers. So that was back <laughs> in the uh, stall back had to be different, Terry right? Bradshaw days yeah. and uh, – now, growing up in Louisville, we were always a Bengals fan. They had, uh, you know, some good some good teams back then. Um, uh, who was the one really good quarterback? Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson. Yeah. Um, so you know what? Uh, and then after that, I, I became a 49ers fan. But uh, you know, I like them all. Uh, let's say hello on Facebook tonight. Wolf Lake, Indiana, Evansville, Indiana, Boonville, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Atlanta, Georgia, Fort Wayne, and Hillsdale, Michigan. Again, keep those. Uh, Keep those cards and letters coming. Let us know where you're watching from tonight. Boonville, Indiana, the home of Devin Mockaby. Devin got his second touchdown of the season, and I think we're seeing more and more what you saw during training camp this year. Well, he's done a good job. He works really hard. Uh, he's going to continue to get better. He's still young. He's still got to grow and do a couple things better, pass protection, understanding what we're doing. But he runs hard. He cares. Uh, he gives us great effort. He's durable, and uh, we're happy he's on our team. Uh, King Drew was out last week. You had to have Dylan Downing and, and uh, Devin in there along with uh, Kobe Lewis. Uh, are you getting what you need right now uh, from a running standpoint out of that position? Well, I think they're working hard. And, uh, you know, we've got to figure out ways to, you know, continue to be better running the ball. And we've we're, we're got to work through that. But, uh, you know, those guys, uh, they play hard. Um, they all have some different strengths and uh, a couple limitations here and there. But uh, they'll, they'll continue to get better. we just got to find – what they do best, and make sure we try to do that. For the third time in three weeks, Charlie Jones went over 100 yards receiving, including a big 55-yard touchdown catch in the fourth quarter as you were making your comeback. Uh, you, you would think that at some point people are going to adjust a little bit, but Charlie Jones has been a great revelation so far this year. Well, he's done a great job, and uh, he's got a good connection with Aiden. Um, you know, he really runs good routes. He can catch the football. He's a competitor. He's not afraid to go across the middle. You know, he finds ways to get open. Even when he's not very open, um, you know, he's a little bit like David Bell in the fact that he will catch the ball uh, when he's covered tightly. And Aiden has thrown it to him when he's covered tightly. And this team did a good job of covering him, a little more tighter than uh, we have seen. Uh, but, uh, you know, he continued to just make plays. And uh, once again, we just got to uh, become a little more balanced and get as many people involved as we can. But uh, he came through for us and made really big plays. would also point out that uh, the guy that he beat for six of his catches on Saturday, including that touchdowns, is a projected first-round draft pick. So he's shown him his wares against the best. Well, that was a good secondary. They had a good good scheme and a good system. And, uh, you know, Charlie found a way, even when he, like I said, when he wasn't wide open, he still is competitive and makes the catch. And that – that does not happen with a lot of receivers. So, you know, Charlie just got to continue to stay healthy and, and play hard. And, uh, you know, we got to, you know, win some football games. Let's go to the phone lines. Our friend Daryl calling in from Philadelphia tonight. Daryl, what's your question for Coach Brom? Hey, ball coach. Hey, I, good game. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I got a lot of takeaways from that game, good takeaways. People only saw the last minute. But quite honestly, Coach, I got to commend you for not getting thrown out the second quarter because <laughs> had I been coached, <laughs> there were at least eight calls that were missed, you know, passing the fairness and holding things that could have been key. And some calls can change the complexity of the game. 
I get it, that we can do things that can help ourselves, and you've addressed all that. But I do want to say that people shouldn't focus on that last part, but some of the things that happened during the game. And I hope that uh, maybe you got a chance to talk to those refs. But um, I do want to ask a question. I was wondering if um, you consider or you guys looked at like a high tempo, you know, because teams seem to struggle, you know, both Penn State and Syracuse, which are very good teams. Uh, and I was just wondering if we were thinking to possibly go with a high tempo because our offense is set up around the path. So people crying about the run should just really shut up because we do extremely well doing what we do well. Well, you've got a lot of good points, and I appreciate you pointing out uh, the penalties. Uh, like uh, like always, uh, we turn plays in at the end of the week to the head of the officials of the Big Ten, and I can't give you what he says uh, back, but uh, – we're, we're right on quite a few of them, so it's unfortunate, but that's just the nature of the game. So as a team, we've said, look, it, it doesn't matter whether we get calls or not. We've got to just keep our mouth shut and play football and, and whatever things we've done. We've got to figure out ways to not do it again. And uh, so we're going to work hard at it. Uh, and on your second point, to be quite honest with you, my wife says the same thing to me every, after every game. Do you wanna, don't you want to go faster? Do you want to use tempo? All those things. And you know, you've got some good points. Uh, you know, what can happen there is, is like, like you said, you could possibly, you know, get a little pass happy. Uh, you could possibly not get in a play that uh, fits uh, what you're going with. But at the same time, you can make some big plays. So we always work on tempo every day. We have a package. Uh, maybe we should use it more. Um, and, you know, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a good point, and, uh, you know, it's one that uh, we'll have to continue to evaluate. And, and really, we need to make sure we're probably mixing some of that in. And uh, if it's going well, we, we do probably need to use it more. All right, we need to take a break. Coming to you live from Walk-Ons, we'll have more in two minutes from the Jeff Brown Show, presented by Rorman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. Our Boilermakers have always been what unite us. To this hallowed field, we return each fall to be a part of something special. We've seen legends born and moments etched in time. Wide open, got him! Touchdown, Purdue! Seth Morales, holy Toledo! Thomas steps away, Coleman football! For nearly a century, Ross-Ade Stadium has been the home of Purdue football. As we forge ahead, we have a rare opportunity to fortify the legacy of future generations of faithful Boilermakers. Together, we will guarantee the passion you have for the old golden black will endure for years to come. Let the carnage and the chaos continue. How about the Boilermakers? Boiler up, friends. The time is now. Saturday. No reason you should go out there and cut it loose. Look at this place. The energy here is electric. Welcome to West Lafayette, folks. This should be a thriller. Welcome back to the Jeff Brown Show. We're live at Walk-Ons in the Purdue Memorial Union. Everyone needs a little playing time. We're going to talk a little bit more about Florida Atlantic uh, in a later segment in the show, but it's, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say a homecoming for you, but you've got some ties to that program. For those who don't know, Florida Atlantic is a new football program. It just started playing football in 2001, and the guy that really put that program together was a fellow named Howard Schnellenberger. Howard was actually their first director of football operations. Uh, he put the program together, and when it came time to pick a coach, I think Howard looked in the mirror and said, I'll do it, and he did it for 11 years. You were on his staff for a year. Talk about the influence that Howard Schnellenberger had on your career. 
Well, I, I firmly believe he was one of the greatest coaches of all time. Uh, he's coached at every level. Uh, he was a disciple of Paul Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama in the Joe Namath days. Uh, he also learned his, his coaching from there, uh, coached at the University of Kentucky. Uh, you know, then he uh, went to the Miami Dolphins, and uh, he was with Don Shula in that tree. They, they were only undefeated team in the Super Bowl. He was the offensive coordinator. Took Miami uh, when they were about ready to shut the program down, which no one would think that, but it was, and then brought them to a national championship. And then uh, he did the same thing, University of Louisville. He, that program was about to shut down. He kept that thing going and afloat and gave it hope and promise. And then he started up Florida Atlantic uh, out of nothing and uh, became the head coach. But just a real football guy, uh, understood the game. He was tough. Uh, he worked his players. He loved to compete. Uh, he respected the game, uh, respected his opponents, but he also had a unique ability to, to motivate his players and get them to believe that they could do anything uh, possible just because of some of the things he said. He was not scared uh, uh, to say what he felt. He was brash. He, he had confidence. So, you know, I know a lot about the program. This program, uh, you know what, it's a hotbed of Florida. You're going to get talent. Uh, and they have talent. They have skill. They have players. They can run. They can catch. They can defend. Uh, and they can continue to recruit just down in that state of part of Florida. Uh, and they play good football. And, uh, you know, I've been there. I understand it. Uh, you know, they're going to come in here hungry, uh, ready for a win, and, and we're going to have to earn this victory. You mentioned Florida being a hotbed of football. They have 114 players on their roster. 81 of them are from the state of Florida, 17 of them from Georgia. So 98 of their 114 players are either from Florida or Georgia, and we know the caliber of football that's played down there. Well, even when I coached there as an assistant, uh, we really just recruited the state of Florida unless you had some connection somewhere else. We dipped into barely South Georgia, and sometimes with quarterbacks we went uh, a lot of places. But uh, there's just a lot of talent, a lot of talent. Uh, you can play football year-round down there, uh, and they're going to have a really good team. And uh, they've won a lot of big games, and they've really built that program up. Uh, go back to uh, when Howard recruited you to Louisville because he also was the coach that recruited Joe Namath to play at Alabama. So he had an eye for quarterbacks and an ability to get you to, to buy into what he was doing. What was his recruiting pitch like back then? Well, he was really good. Like I said, he was very confident. Uh, he had a ton of experience uh, and success, uh, and he wasn't scared to tell you that. But he recruited Joe Namath. Uh, even after that, he recruited my father to Alabama, and my father ended up not going there uh, because his, one of his coaches went and coached at the University of Louisville. Uh, but then he recruited me. And uh, you know what? When you have someone recruiting you that has won a national championship, has won a Super Bowl, uh, has developed quarterbacks at a high level, uh, you, you kind of listen. And I just think, uh, you know, he carried that confidence. Um, you know, he was well-respected across the country for just, uh, you know, knowing the game and, and coaching it the right way. And, and uh, he, he was tough. And I just, uh, you know, you learn a lot from coaches like that, guys that do it the right way and that respect the game. So I appreciate all my time with them. When you're talking to your team, and we've seen you give some motivational speeches, how much of Howard and how much of the other influences, some of the coaches you've had, how much do they kind of seep into your mind when you give those talks? Well, I think the main thing that I've learned from Coach Nellenberger is, um, you know, he wasn't scared to take on anybody at any time. It didn't matter how good his team really was. Uh, and he got his team to believe that they could beat anybody, no matter what your record was or what other people said about you. And I do think that's one of the reasons here we've been able to win some really, really big football games when maybe no one thought we could because I, I, I try to do that. I mean, uh, you know, we're going to take the field uh, every game and we're going to play to win. And uh, you know what? Sometimes we're going to lose. Sometimes uh, we're going to be too aggressive. But we're going to play to win. And we have found a way to uh, get our players to do things that didn't, people didn't think were possible. And so that's <laughs> what I learned from him. And, of course, uh, you know, building programs and, <coughs> excuse me, Trying to sustain success is, is the next thing that we got to get going. All right, we're coming to you from walk-ons. We'll give the coach a break. When we come back, we'll be talking with linebacker O.C. Brothers. It's the Jeff Brown Show presented by the Roman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. And in a few minutes, we'll give you a fair, guaranteed cash offer to buy your car. Lorman is your vehicle buying center at your home or at one of our convenient dealerships. Let Lorman buy your car today. Visit Lorman.com. I play action. Here's O'Connell. Winds up. Sideline over receiver. Got him at the 25. Jones in motion. 
quickly to Charlie Jones. Scampers to the outside, heading to the pylon. Diving for a touchdown. Seven yard pitch and catch and run. Like that and make a play on O'Connell to throw again. Sets his feet, long ball. Jones wide open. Touchdown. 36 yards going deep. O'Connell with a long ball. Favorite target, easy pickings. Purdue, big time. As this series develops here for Purdue. Second down and eight. O'Connell underneath. Charlie Jones again with the first down. I tell you, Charlie Jones is sizzling, folks. And he's just a true freshman. First and 15. O'Connell guns it over the middle, and it's caught by Charlie Jones. Chuck Sizzle does it again. O'Connell again. He's going down. Field. He's got Charlie Jones. Charlie Jones has got a touchdown. with the Joneses. Tracy in motion, O'Connell with time. Touchdown, Purdue! And Zaki Wheatley takes a bit of a bad angle, and there's Charlie Jones. Two feet down, touchdown, Boilermaker. O'Connell over the middle. Jones with another catch. Charlie Jones. Continues. He's calm, he's confident, he's taking his time. Third and five. Over the middle, Jones, bullseye. Charlie Jones wrapped up and dropped there. First and goal, Purdue. Cornelius Doe saved another touchdown. I mean, Aiden O'Connor, he knows where he's going the whole time. He holds the safety, he finds Charlie Jones. And Catch the ball with his hands, turn and get upfield immediately. Quickly to the end zone for the score. Jones is third on the day. For tuning in tonight, it is the Jeff Brom Show. The Boilermakers in Florida Atlantic Owls Saturday night, 7.30 kickoff. We'll be on the air for it at 6.30. It's time for the Pro Boilers feature, where we look at how former Purdue student-athletes are doing in their professional sports careers. Pro Boilers is presented by Indiana Kitchen Premium Pork Products. Get to know us at indianakitchen.com. Both our Pro Boilers and Indiana Kitchen are boiler made. A uh, shout-out to Xander Horvath, who made a little NFL history last week, became the first running back with a touchdown catch in his first two games in the NFL since 1942. Xander playing for the Los Angeles Chargers. Raheem Mostert and the Miami Dolphins had a huge comeback against Baltimore. Raheem with 51 yards rushing and 28 receiving yards. Anthony Brown played every defensive snap for the Cowboys this week, had four solo tackles and a win over Cincinnati. We mentioned David Bell a little bit earlier in the show for the Cleveland Browns, had his first professional reception on Sunday. And Juwan Bentley of the New England Patriots had five tackles in their win over Pittsburgh. So those are our pro, pro boilers for this week. And we are joined on the show by O.C. Brothers. O.C. is a junior from southwest Brevard County, Florida. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, O.C., with the uh, geography of Florida, where in the state is that? Uh, I would say the best way to describe it would be like Cocoa Beach area. Like if somebody asks, I say NASA because NASA is like the – global thing. So I'm about like 20, 25 minutes from NASA. So it's pretty warm down there most of the year. Very. Every single day. Uh, let me talk first about the name. Uh, as I understand it, OC is short for Octavius, which is your given name. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So the first two letters. Was that something that you shortened on your own or did other people have problems saying Octavius? Uh, I got it from my dad. My dad um, had that name as a child growing up. So I'm a junior. I'm named after my dad. So okay. I just kind of took it on. So you gotta, you got to be a little unique, right? Yeah, yes, sir. You originally went to Auburn, not mm -hmm. too far away down in the south, and then you decided to transfer. Uh, talk about the decision to come to the Big Ten and play. Um, transfer from Auburn, um, it was after my sophomore year. It was a really uh, big decision to make, but, you know, when I entered the portal, I was kind of unsure where I would land. And, um, you know, I talked to a whole bunch of schools, and when I talked to Purdue, you know, uh, I felt like it was home, you know, talking to the coaches, you know, looking at the facility, everything. I couldn't visit because there was still COVID going on. But 
as I was like seeing everything video wise, talking to the coaches and everything, I really felt like it was like a good place to call home, and it has been. That had to make the whole process that much more difficult. It's always hard to choose a school and choose a school for the second time, but when you can't visit the school, uh, you've got to go on a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's what I did. You know, I just prayed about it a lot, talked to my parents a lot, and you know, I just, like you said, went on a leap of faith. Uh, what was your first Indiana winter like last year? Oh, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> I never. Did they talk to you about that on the Zoom calls that you had? Yeah, they did. Actually, they told me it was going to be like like nothing I've ever experienced. And like being from Florida, being from the South, I've like never been in snow until I came up here. So when I came up here, there was a whole bunch of snow on the floor and everything like that. And it was crazy. It was unbelievable. Uh, are you ready to leave the winters? Are you kind of you, you're looking forward to winter number two? Because like, it's going to be winter again here soon. Yeah. And in case they didn't tell you that, it does happen every year. Um. I would say um, I like winters because, like, you know, going back, you know, to being from Florida, you pretty much experience the same season the whole time, which is, like, summer. And, you know, uh, being up here, you get to experience all four seasons, which I really like. Like, I really like the snow. Like, when I first came here, I, like, literally dove in the snow and made snow angels and everything. Uh, your role has changed a little bit this season. Last year, you played behind Jalen Alexander, who was the team's leading tackler. This year, you're a starter. Uh, talk about that progression and how you've had to roll, uh, kind of grow into your role as a leader on that defense. Um, like, like you said, last year I played behind a really good linebacker, Jalen. Um, he really, like, mentored me, you know, because he's played all four years, and he really took me under his wing, mentored me, allowed me to learn the game from him. And um, I was using that, you know, going into this year, you know, um, as a starter, I know I had to step up, be a leader, and that's really what I try to do, you know, in the linebacker room, defense, whatever it takes, you know, um, off season, I was kind of uh, trying to step it up, you know, in the off season workouts, you know, just let everybody know, like, I'm here, you know, I'm leader. Last week, you took on one of the best running backs in the country, Sean Tucker, and you held him under 50 yards. Uh, there was a lot of Heisman talk before. I don't think there was a lot of Heisman talk after. <laughs> Talk about coming up to that challenge and meeting the challenge of taking on the top running back. Um, it was actually exciting, you know, to go against somebody with a name like that in the country. I believe he was All-American last year. So it really, you know, it wasn't any nerves, nothing scary. It was just, you know, it's me and him, you know, and I knew I had that matchup going into the game, you know. So I really just accepted the challenge and stepped up to it. I listened to an interview that you did, uh, did during fall camp, and you said, what I do best is, quote, run and hit. Uh, is that natural? Is that something you've really had to learn over the years? Um, running hit, that's always been natural since I was a kid, you know, growing up playing football. But um, I ended up playing quarterback a lot. So when I ended up going to college for linebacker, I had to get back in that mindset and everything like that. So just running and hitting, you know, that's, that's kind of what I live by. Lastly, you get to play in front of the home crowd again this week. The fans have been terrific, especially the student section. The ross Aid Brigade has been there early. has to give you guys a big emotional lift when you come out of the tunnel every week. Yeah, it does, you know, and all the players, we always talk about it before the game, after the game, because, like, we know our fans are going to show up. We know they're going to support. And like you said, the student section, like, one of the best in the country, I believe, you know, and our fans are just so loyal and supportive and everything. So I really, I'm, I'm really grateful for the support. OC, keep making snow angels and keep making tackles. Good luck the rest of the season. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, when we come back, we'll talk to Nick Zacchino. It's the Jeff Brom Show presented by the Roman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. Your car may never be worth more than it is right now. If you have five minutes, I can prove it to you. I'm Trey Roman. Tracy in motion. O'Connell with time. Touchdown, Purdue! Watch Downing 38 as he comes across and gets a good block right there on Mustafer that allows for a little extra time. Now it's on O'Connell to anticipate and get that ball out in front of him on that left side. As they're turned around in the back end, Zaki Wheatley takes a bit of a bad angle, and there's Charlie Jones. O'Connell, Maccabee, big hole! Touchdown, Purdue! And Syracuse finally gives up a red zone score. O'Connell looking over the middle. Beautiful throw. Finds his man. Touchdown! On the button to Ferfari. And Purdue is clicking. The former quarterback's got some hands off of Ferry. But this is one of the things, Joe, that we've talked about here, right? O'Connell looking. To the back of the end zone, touchdown! He goes to the tight end, Payne Durham. And it's right over my 
Markel Jones' head. He's dropping into his own coverage in a dark by O'Connell. He stays flat so he can cut off the safety like that and make a play on the O'Connell to throw again. Sets his feet. Long ball. Jones wide open. Touchdown! 36 yards going deep. O'Connell with a long ball. Favorite target, easy pickings. Purdue, big time. Charlie Jones in the slot. O'Connell steps up, throws to the end zone, touchdown! Purdue Memorial Union, where it's always game day with a taste of Louisiana. The 2022 Purdue football season is presented by Purdue Global. Purdue Global is Purdue's accredited and affordable online solution for working adults. Persistence pays off at Purdue Global. And it's ironic that we talk about persistence because probably the, one of the most persistent guys in this football program is sitting next to me, Nick Zacchino. He is a long snapper from Cedar Grove, New Jersey. Um, how many friends and family were able to make it over to Syracuse this week to see you play? Um, I had about seven people, my parents, uh, my sister, my sister's friend, and my cousin. So that, that, it's a little closer to home than you usually get. Yep. You're a Purdue graduate already. Yeah, I graduated in, uh, in the spring, in May, so that was nice, and now I'm in grad school. There so. you go. So you've got that part of it taken care of. Uh, last year, Purdue closed out its football season with a bowl win in the Music City Bowl against Tennessee, which was sweet for you. Not only did you get a bowl win, but you got to beat your dad's alma mater. So you got bragging rights now forever at the Thanksgiving dinner table, right? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, growing up, my dad was my role model, and uh, Tennessee was my school and all that, and I always wanted to go there. But coming here and playing in that bowl game was meant a little more to me and my family. Um, he got to get with a lot of his friends from the past and his old teammates and it was just a great uh, entire week and then obviously to win the game like that was fantastic so he was a center at Tennessee but he was a long snapper so he taught you the craft didn't he yeah so when I was young I mean he was never that dad that was always hounding me like let's go long snap let's go long snap this and that I would always grab him and uh, get him off the couch and say let's snap or let's go outside and throw the ball and this and that so I was always the one that wanted to do it. Did it come naturally to you? Oh, it did. So I, I played quarterback also um, in high school. So it's not much different. Um, it's just you're upside down, obviously. <laughs> but it's, it's the same idea and the same motion, of how the ball comes out of your hand. Um, so it did come natural, yes. So you snap on both field goals and on punts. Is one more difficult than the other? Is it the same technique? No, it's the same snap. You don't want to change up how you snap uh, either field goals or punts. Um, you want to be consistent. I mentioned persistence at the very beginning, and I think some people know Nick's story, but in case you don't, uh, this is actually your, it, it's your fifth year playing football, but it's your seventh year since you graduated from high school because you had some yes. major health issues after your first year. First of all, how are you doing? But if you can summarize uh, a little bit what you had and, and how you've been able to overcome it. So I'm doing really, really well, um, just as bad as good as you can. Um, the doctors tell me all the time, every time I go see them when I'm back home, how great I'm doing. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2016 and then uh, had to get three surgeries in six months in 2018. And uh, I was... Very tough time because I should have been playing. I mean, all my friends were out doing what they were doing in college and this and that, and I'm homesick. Um, but I had a colostomy bag. I had to get my colon removed. So it was a very tough surgery and a uh, tough couple years there. But after that, and I came back to, I came to Purdue after those surgeries in 2019, only about eight, nine months from the final surgery, and then playing that fall. Um, almost at 100%, so. How, uh, you know, mentally, how were you able to overcome that? Because there were times, and, and, and yeah, absolutely, uh, that, that is certainly worth a round of applause. The physical part is hard enough, but mentally, not knowing if you're going to get back to 100%, not knowing if you're going to be able to play football, what kept you going? Playing football, wanting to play football. Um, a lot of people and doctors were like, we're not sure, this or that, but luckily, being a long snapper and not a quarterback or a receiver that gets hit all the time, um, they allowed me to 
play and do all things I wanted. But playing football and getting back to playing football is what got me through the entire process and being sick. Now, is this, so this is going to be your final season collegiately, correct? Yes, yeah, this is my last year. Is that the end of the road? Do you want to play more or is this, um, is this going to be it? I, I would like to. I mean, you never know. I'm going to give it a shot, do pro day, see how that goes. Um, but if this is the end of the road, I mean, it's been a, been a great run up and down, but I'm going to give it a shot and see how that goes. Well, you've certainly inspired a lot of people. Uh, when, whenever the, the football playing days are done, what do you want to do? What's, what's next for Nick Zacchino after football? So I'm not really sure yet. Um, I graduated with a selling and sales management degree. I get, I'm getting a couple of certificates now that I'm in grad school. Um, but I'll probably go home um, and see what life takes me from there. But uh, there's some options that I could have. My family owns a business, and uh, we'll see what goes from there. Well, Nick, again, congratulations on a great journey. And Nick is one of those guys, if we don't say his name on Saturdays, it's a perfect day. Because, right? Yeah. It's, I don't want to be you know, known for anything. It's kind of like, yeah, that's right. And, you know, the offensive lineman, if we don't call your name for a holding, it's a great day. If we yep. don't call Nick's name for a bad snap, and we haven't, it's a great day. Congratulations yep. on your journey, and good luck the rest of the way Thank this year. You. Thank you. All right, we'll have the coach back with us next. It's the Jeff Brom Show presented by the Roman Automotive Group on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. You work hard. Penn State may have to open it up now, but they don't. They give it to Singleton, and he's chopped down. Great job by Corey Trice. On second and eight, four receivers in the pattern. Screws is under heat. He's buried. Dropped quickly by Jack Sullivan. First and 22. On the ground with Dinka. Met by a host of Purdue tacklers. Trailing 24 to 21. Clifford. In trouble and sack. They brought pressure. And this time it's Humpick. They'll toss it for Dinka. Dinka angles has no running room whatsoever. Outstanding defensive work. Kieran Douglas, the linebacker, the first man to intercept it. This is third and goal. Dinka is in the backfield with Screw. Gavin pumps it. Protection breaking down. Throws one into traffic. Deflected and picked off. Intercepted. Jamari Brown with the interception. Trying to get him acclimated to the atmosphere here. Gavin Screws climbs up in the pocket, gets tripped up and down. 12 yards, first down at the 48. Clifford over the middle, high and picked. Jefferson with room. Can he get a block? Chris Jefferson still on the move with a late. Jefferson, touchdown, Purdue. And as you watch Sean Clifford, he's going to be trying to get this route right here, and he's got the route. He's going to have Tinsley wide open and just airmails him. I mean, this, this ball is just way over his head. Tinsley can't even jump up there and try to bat it down or do anything. He can't try to disrupt Jefferson. Screws. Looks for that pass. It picked off. Intercepted and this time Cam Allen will walk his way all the way. Touchdown. Boilermakers as the presenting sponsor of the Jeff Brown Show and proud partner of Purdue Athletics, Worman Automotive Group, Boiler Up and Hammer Down. We'll be on at 6.30 on Saturday night. You can join us also on Facebook Live at 6 o'clock. We'll give you all the updates that we have at that point and get you ready for kickoff, which will be shortly after 7.30. First ever meeting between Purdue and Florida Atlantic. Uh, Florida Atlantic, Jeff, in their four first four games, they've scored a touchdown on three of their four opening drives. So this is a team that you've got to be ready for right out of the locker room. Well, they have a transfer quarterback from Florida who's a really good athlete, and he can throw the ball. Uh, so he's dangerous. They've got two really good running backs, uh, and they've got good skill players. So this is a team that will spread you out and uh, try to have a little balance of run and pass. Um, they've got athletes on defense. Um, you know, they've, uh, they can beat anybody. So it's uh, going to be a test for us. Um, we definitely know we're going to have to play well. We're going to have to improve on all the small things and the mistakes we made, and uh, guys are going to step up and do a good job. You mentioned their running backs. They have run the ball with success, averaging, I think, more than 200 yards a game, and they've got two guys that they like to run both. Um, again, it's going to be a test for your defense. It will, and uh, I think uh, – Every week uh, from here on is going to be a, a game that we've got to figure out ways to play well. We've got to figure out ways to get better. We've got to figure out ways to 
win the small battles of uh, you know penalties and turnovers and uh, you know casting in the red zone and uh, good on special teams and that's just how football works and uh, that's the great thing about it is uh, you know we we become a very competitive team. Uh, I think our guys play to win. They play hard. I think our fans have been tremendous and have supported the team. And, you know, I know they want to work hard to go out there and try to win as many as we can. And, uh, but they just have to know it's got to be a weekly battle, a weekly test. And every week, new guys got to step in there and get the job done. And that's what's going to have to happen this week. After this game on Saturday, your home schedule is halfway done, and we're not even through the month of September yet. So you've got five of your last eight games on the road. Going back again to Syracuse, were you happy with, in general, with how your team adapted to the road environment and were ready to play coming out on Saturday? No, I think so. I think they worked hard. Uh, they've done a good job this season. Um, you know, there's some new, new faces in there at times uh, with a couple guys we have out that, uh, you know, have to step up and just improve that maybe haven't been with us as long. Uh, so we just got to figure out, uh, you know, what some of those guys do best, make sure we take care of them, put them in the best position we can, make sure that uh, whatever mistakes we make, uh, we, we, we figure it out and, and try not to repeat it. But I know our guys play hard, and uh, they want to win, and, uh, but uh, everyone has to understand uh, all the small details that uh, have to get done the right way in order to give yourself a chance to win. Uh, you and Willie Tackard have something in common. They're head coach. You were both head coaches at Western Kentucky. He's also been at Florida State and at Oregon. Is there a common theme you see with Willie Taggart coach teams? Well, Willie uh, was a very good player himself at Western Kentucky. Uh, he played under Jack Harbaugh, the father of the Harbaugh's, uh, and uh, comes from that tree. And that's kind of uh, his style of coaching. Uh, you know, he really wants to run the football. He wants to be a physical football team. Uh, you know, he relates well with his players, um, and he wants to win. So he's just coached at a lot of levels, uh, and he's been through a lot. And a lot of times when you've been through a lot, good and bad, it toughens you up, it hardens you up, and you can adapt. And uh, he's done a really good job, uh, you know, where he's at. And uh, like I said, we're going to have to play well. Final segment of the Jeff Brom Show presented by the Rorman Automotive Group is coming up on the Purdue Global Sports Network from Learfield. Attention producers. Our Boilermakers have always been what unite us. To this hallowed field, we return each fall to be a part of something special. We've seen legends born and moments etched in time. For nearly a century, ross Aid Stadium has been the home of Purdue football. As we forge ahead, we have a rare opportunity to fortify the legacy of future generations of faithful Boilermakers. Together, we will guarantee the passion you have for the old golden black will endure for years to come. Let the carnage and the chaos continue. How about the Boilermakers? Boiler up, friends. The time is now. Saturday. No reason you shouldn't go out there and cut it loose. Look at this place. The energy here is electric. Welcome to West Lafayette, folks. This should be a thriller. Twenty twenty two coming up Saturday night, Boilermakers in Florida Atlantic at seven thirty. We were just talking during the break of uh, the game at Iowa last week had three lightning delays in it, and I believe it ended somewhere around 1.30 central time. You went through one delay uh, in 2017, your first year when Minnesota came in here. Have you ever had multiple delays in a game? Uh, I don't think to that extent. Uh, we, we, I've been somewhere we've had a few, and you really have to not really wait for the rain to clear, but you have to wait for the lightning and uh, the next strike. And 
uh, you know, that, that's a long night uh, for the Iowa fans uh, for that game. Uh, looking at the weather, it looks like we, we might, be, might be pretty good, huh? Might be perfect. It looks like it's going to be a great night for football on the Saturday night. It's a high during the day, about 75 or so, but it should be just perfect weather for football on Saturday. That sounds good. Uh, let's talk about keys then. Cutting down on penalties is one. What other things would you like to see your team do a little bit better as you get ready for your last non-conference game? Oh, my, I feel like we've dr- addressed them uh, so much with our coaches and uh, team that, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about quite a few. And, uh, you know, really just penalties and having more discipline and keeping our mouths shut, just playing football as hard as we can and congratulating each other together but don't make any excessive celebrations. That's going to be important. Um, you know, we talk situational football. I just think we haven't been as good in two-minute situations into the half. Um, and even a couple short yardage situations, I feel like we've been too aggressive, which, uh, you know, I applaud Coach for being aggressive, but we just probably need to dial that back a little bit and make sure we're safe as well because we've gotten burnt on a couple mistakes by our players. So those are the keys. You want to just have the perfect mix of aggression, but the perfect mix, you can't give up big plays on, on fourth and one and, and things like that, uh, that that count for touchdowns. And and even two-minute situation. So just a lot of things that have happened. You try to learn from it. You try not to make it happen. At the same time, you know, we want to try to sustain drives and score points and, and score in the red zone. And, uh, you know, special teams has, has been okay. I think we need to be better. So it's just a lot of things to work on. Uh, when you play good football teams, uh, you can work them all you want. Uh, you know, sometimes they're going to win uh, some of those battles. You just have to find a way to win more. You have to find a way to not make critical mistakes uh, that can cost you and just hang in there. And you got to expect this game to go in the fourth quarter, and you have to have the composure, the discipline, and the toughness to win at the end. Well, I know you'll find something to do all day on Saturday. I know you don't love those night kickoffs, but uh, you, you got one, and you're going to have a great atmosphere to play. And by the way, Florida Atlantic, this is their fifth straight night game. They've only played night games this season, so we'll see how they adapt on the road. Good luck this week, Jeff, and let's see if we can get that homecoming win on Saturday night. Okay, thank you. All right, the Boilermakers again taking on Florida Atlantic, uh, and then a couple of games on the road after that, Minnesota and Maryland as we get into Big Ten play starting in October. Our engineer tonight, Wes Scott, producer uh, Jacob Smith with some help from Ray Klapmeyer. Our video tonight produced by Hunter Massengill. We thank everybody for that. Again, we'll be back here next uh, Wednesday night for the next edition of the Jeff Brown Show. It'll be on at 6.05 as we are throughout the football season. Boilermakers in Florida Atlantic at 7.30. Our broadcast starts here on the Learfield Purdue Sports Network at 6.30. And again, we'll have our uh, Facebook Live segment coming up at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. For the head coach, for OC Brothers and Nick Sacchino, this is Tim Newton. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you on Saturday at Ross Aid.